or 20, they start getting smarter and smarter and smarter and start learning how to cast spells. So if you're adventuring down in a dungeon and you see one cranium rat, then there's 10, 20, and they start firing fireballs at you and doing psionic attacks, suddenly having 10 different spell casters that you're fighting all at once is a nightmare scenario. We made sure absolutely that was possible in Torment just to sort of reverse the idea that, you know what, rats aren't these easy things to kill. They're a lot more dangerous in, 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 in large numbers. Uh, okay, so now uh, Undead. Uh, I was so bored of Undead and role-playing games that I couldn't imagine actually even why they were even included anymore. Um, with a possible exception of games like Left 4 Dead, which actually gives you an adrenaline rush and gives you a sense of fear when you're fighting zombies, there was rarely a role-playing game that would ever give me a sense of fear that I was fighting one of the walking dead. Like, that should be a terrifying experience. But all it ever seemed to mean in Dungeons & Dragons was that you would just change your weapons to make sure that the skeleton wasn't taking half damage against your slashing attack, or that you made sure you didn't use piercing weapons against zombies because they would only take one hit point of damage. Like, all of these game mechanic conventions that completely robbed all the life out of the undead in the game. Um, so what we tried to do in Torment was we actually said, okay, we can't really, con we, it's really hard to fight that convention in the sense of Dungeons & Dragons universe. So what we'll do is we'll take these undead and we'll make them very, very human. And the undead in Torment are some of the nicest people that you are going to encounter in the Planescape universe. Uh, we actually set up situations in the game where you can sort of juxtapose the undead cultures versus the human cultures, and ultimately the human cultures would come up would come up lacking. They would be greedy, evil, self-serving, but the undead had a much larger perspective on their lives and how they treated each other, from the ghoul societies to the zombie societies to the skeleton societies. And we try to make that as interesting as possible and sort of turn that undead cliche on its head. <coughs> Uh, again, like I was sick about having to decide things about my character without ever actually having been in the world. Uh, Torment solved that by starting you off as an as an as an I can't even speak as an amnesiac. Um, I was also sick of saving and loading, so I tried to make sure that uh, as an immortal character, uh, not only would you get back from the dead uh, in relatively quick order, uh, also you also had the power to resurrect your companions at will. Because uh, ultimately, whenever a companion also dies in the game, they're lost forever, that would just mean another reload. And also, I didn't want to spend any gold pieces to raise dead on characters, because I don't want to lose any money in a role-playing game either. So anyway, the whole essence of Torment was to remove the save load screen. Uh, Sega so Companion's dying. So basically, I had all these RPG cliches to deal with, and uh, some of them uh, I embraced, and other ones I just turned away from. Uh, and we tried to approach all the character designs and story designs in Torment from the opposite side. For example, we had a character in the game, one of the companions, uh, Fall from Grace. And when we were examining her character, we were trying to take all the RPG cliches and sort of turn them on their head. So Fall from Grace uh, was a succubus, and uh, the succubus thing had pretty much been done very well in role-playing games. Uh, they were always these leather-corseted uh, harlots that would run around with whips and make these delightful screams whenever you kill them in Diablo 1. And that irritated me so much uh, uh, that what I wanted to do was create the idea of a succubus that was as far removed from that concept as possible. Note that, however, uh, I still gave in to the cliche of a succubus uh, at its heart because I still wanted the chance to be able to adventure with a succubus. So, uh, what we did was he took Fall from Grace and we're like, okay, we're going to make her uh, not interested in sex at all. Uh, we're going to make her very, very polite. Uh, no matter what any character says to her in the game, she always responds with the most well thought out, polite response to anything she said and always tries to look for the positive in everything. Uh, she was also very wise and intelligent. Uh, she cared about people around her and did not want to see them suffer. And also we wanted her to be a figure in the game that the player character could fall in love with. Uh, and then we took all those elements and we put her within the shell of a succubus. And our idea with that was if a succubus is who you're supposed to be at your nature, at your core, what kind of character, what sort of things would have had to have happened to you 
in terms of your motivation, personality, that would actually cause you to demonstrate all these traits. Uh, and what we did was uh, Fall from Grace was pretty well received as a companion in Torment, um, uh, mostly because of all the opposites that we dealt with with her character. Uh, and also she was very, very well acted as well. So uh, the, uh, many kudos to the voice actress who actually did the lines for Fall from Grace. We also uh, used uh, uh, that idea of opposites when we were dealing with a theme with Torment. Uh, it was a very, very selfish RPG. Uh, everything in the game revolved around you, which is ultimately how I think most games should be. Um, usually role-playing games up to this point uh, had you uh, have the fate of a nation or a world in your hands. Uh, I decided to cut through the bullshit and go, you know what, the only thing I really care about is what happens to my character and what makes him more powerful. And torment revolves all around uh, that aspect. Everything is about finding out who you are, about gaining more power to prevent all these endless deaths happening to you, and basically just creating a very selfish experience where everything in the game, everyone, everyone has had their lives uh, affected by actions that you've done. So. Uh, so we took a cliche. Uh, the player character wakes up with amnesia and torment. But we took that cliche, and what we decided to do was expand upon it and go, okay, well, uh, this character wakes up with amnesia, which is very, very common in uh, Japanese RPGs. What we'll try and do is introduce some new mechanics into it. So the idea that whenever you suffered enough damage to die as an immortal, that's what actually triggered your amnesia in the game. And this opened itself up to a whole host of plot line, plot line possibilities. The idea that you as an immortal character has been around for God knows how long, but your personality keeps resetting every time you die. And we were like, okay, well that sounds great, because then all these previous incarnations of you have all done these things in the game world that now you are going to have to answer for. And people who don't realize you have amnesia are also going to blame or praise you for these things as well. So as you're going through the world of torment, you see all the repercussions that all these previous incarnations have done. Also, it helped explain the idea that every time a new player picked up torment, they could play the main character differently, and it would all make sense in the context of this curse that he had on him. If, a, if one player plays the character as an evil bastard and the other one's like a lawful good paladin, that's just how the amnesia and immortality thing works. The nameless one has, an, has the chance to reinvent himself every time he comes back from these, 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 uh, these deaths that occur to him. Uh, it was very much uh, like Memento in many respects, uh, except that uh, the character in that movie uh, was not immortal, uh, but he did have that sense of being disconnected from his environment and having to figure out the notes and, element and things that he'd left as clues for himself to try and make sense of what was going on to him. <clears throat> All right. Uh, well, before I go on to uh, the canceled work that I did at Fallout 3, did you guys have any questions you wanted to ask uh, about the torment process? Or am I just doing it so well? Can, can I just ask, which came first in that project? Was it theme or was it character? Or was um, it, thing? It, uh, it started with theme. Uh, it actually started when I first interviewed Interplay. Um, the division director for uh, Dragonplay, which, Dragon which later became uh, Blackout Studios, uh, the division director interviewed me and he's like, okay, well, if you could design any role-playing game like, how would you have the first five minutes of that start? And I was like, well, that's an interesting question. And I was like, well, uh, I would start from the death screen. And what I would do is play the entire game as if, I, as if the death screen was the first thing that happened. And that would obviously, I thought it would be an interesting twist for the player to get their head around. And then, the, and then the whole idea came, well, how do you build elements around what happens after the death screen? Okay, well, obviously death can't be permanent. Uh, the character obviously can't die. And then from that initial idea, we just started building up the game mechanic elements around that. So theme came first, and then the actual character, the character concept came after that. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Chris, I've got one question. Shoot. Um, just quickly, you talk about death in the game, because now I've played a mainstream tournament. Um, but 
character, you can die later in the game. Though, and you're saying that your amnesia resets once again. Okay, now how do you 